Well, hello, lovely listeners. Today, I have the wonderful Richard Vobes. Um, Richard is a fellow truther, I would say, although my son likes to call us truth theorists because nobody knows what the hell the truth is anyway. Um, and I can't disagree with him on that one. Um, and I've been watching uh, Richard's podcast. Richard has his own um, podcast show and uh, he's also known as the Old Explorer. And when I was listening to James Dellingpole the other day, um, I hadn't realized that you were doing a lot of sort of farm countryside stuff back in the day. That was your, is that right? Yes. Um, we used to do heritage, landscape and nature. That was That's our it. thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And hello, by the way, and thank you for having me on your show. Yes, thank you very much for being here. It's an absolute um, honor to have you because uh, obviously I know you've got a big following on YouTube, even though, you know, if YouTube had their way, I'm sure they'd get rid of you. But um, yeah, you've been banned a few times, haven't you? So um... I have. Yes, I think four times now, but um, I'm still hanging on by my fingernails. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome. It's uh, it's amazing to have you. So um, me and the, the listeners and the viewers, we all love to know where people have come from. And I know that your previous life, you were in you do something with my men, you're in entertainment, obviously presenting all that sort of thing. So go as far back as you want to in terms of your previous life and any sort of, you know, pivotal moments really that got you to doing what you what you're doing now. Like lots of us, Richard, I'm sure 2020 was a massive eye opener. Um, so I'd be really intrigued to know sort of your journey with all of this as well. OK, well, I suppose um, one has to go right back to when I was, I don't know, something like seven or eight before my parents got divorced. I used to play with my father's reel to reel tape recorder and I and um, sort of old technology, uh, but technology that you could see working, unlike the stuff today where it's swipe here and, you know, click here and, and everything's very magical. And it's all behind glass and very glossy, but uh, you can't see how it's working. With the reel-to-reel tape recorders, I love to um, speed them up and slow them down. So I'd record my voice, and then you'd hear um, it. I'd go very, very fast, like that, and high pitched mm -hmm. or very slow. Slow. <laughs> and I used to love that because um, I've always been interested in storytelling, um, theatricals, and things like that. So I used to make up my own little scripts on the fly. I tend to work better when it's on the fly. And I would play it back. So I would have these silly adventures and record it and then use sound effects and, and all of that. So I used to love audio. Um, and as I got older, I got into cine um, stuff, Super 8, Standard 8, Single 8, 16 mil, um, became fascinated with what you could capture on um, on film and I loved the paraphernalia. That's something that we we no longer have in this world. Paraphernalia, you know, it's like um, cups of tea these days. It's a tea bag, kettle, that's it. Whereas, you know, in the old days, um, or very posh places, you get tea cups, tea pots, and you get lo real loose leaf tea, and you get all, all the paraphernalia. And I love that whole thing. Um, and so with a cine projector, you'd have to get the projector out, the screen, the roll of film, and you put it on the thing and it would whir away. And you'd get um, back in those days, three, three minutes and 20 seconds of Super 8 film. And if any of your listeners are as old as I am or older, you will all remember um, we, the, the excitement when the yellow envelope used to come back from Kodak and yeah. drop through the letterbox and you go, oh, oh, and you'd have to go, hang on, everyone, I'm going to get it all set up. And you'd all sit around for three minutes and 20 seconds of watching something on a screen. Now it's, you know, on the phone, it's instant. It's so, and you can film for hours. And the quality is amazing. In those days, it was, it was um, slightly shaky. Um, uh, some of it was overexposed. So it was all orange and all of that. Um and but and then you could edit it and splice it together and literally glue bits together and it would go through the gate on the projector and get stuck and burn and, and they'll be oh blimey um and it was great fun um and so that's kind of where my filmmaking uh interest came i was very when i was about 14 i lived in uh, horsham in sussex and where i lived it backed onto a farm 
And one day in the farm, it was a derelict farm, and one day down the old unmetalled road, this Ford Capri came hurtling down and two blokes leapt out, rolled onto their um, haunches and pointed guns. And my mate and I were playing in the fields, mucking about, and these guys were pointing their guns. We thought, oh, my God, what's going on? And then they got back in the car, reversed it back a bit, and then came back down again and did the same thing. They did this three times. We're going, what the hell is going on? <laughs> then we, we saw the camera. And these guys were making a stunt film, a, a promotional film to, to show off their stunts. And they had this sort of vague kidnapping theme. And they were climbing over this abandoned building, shooting at one another, falling off the roof. And eventually they set fire to one building where a girl had supposedly been kidnapped. She came running out on fire and the crew put her out, you know, all these sort of early things. And... Um, and I fell in love with the whole thing. And that's what I wanted to do, having watched these guys. I wanted to be either a film producer, a film director, or an actor and, and do that kind of stuff. And at the time, you had things like uh, the Sweeney and um, the professionals, you know, all of that sort of hard-hitting police stuff. And I thought, that's that's what I wanted to do. Um, that didn't actually happen, of course. Uh, and I'm very pleased I'm not in mainstream media now, of course. But at the time, that was that was very much my dream. Um, but I was at a a, a second, what do they call it? A secondary education comprehensive school, 1970s, typical sort of comprehensive school, where if you if you weren't really top of the class, you were unlikely to go on to university. So you were encouraged to get an ordinary job. And so I went into printing. Um, and But in printing, I sort of learned a lot about presenting yourself on paper and promoting yourself and things like that and developing photographs and positioning them and, and things, which has all been very handy for promotional material down the line. Um, but I didn't want to do that as a full-time career. And I was still wanting to be a film director and, you know, that there was something in me that was saying, I'm I'm not going to be a cog in somebody else's machine. I want to do something myself. And that independence I must have got from my parents and has stayed with me even now, you know, and, and doing my own show on YouTube. But um, so I I kind of got into making some of my own films. And in the 90s, I'm, I'm missing out loads of my my life just to sort of get through <laughs> through all this quickly. But in the nineties, I I put together a a children's television series idea, and we filmed it. We did it all ourselves on sixteen mil, very expensive, uh, and we presented it to the television companies, and most of them rejected it. But two of them, Granada Television and Scottish Television, said we we're quite interested in this idea, and it was an idea of two spacemen who crash landed on earth and were having adventures, comedy adventures in a sort of little 10 minute thing. I, I, I refer to it as Laurel and Hardy in spacesuits because that's mm. effectively, it was a sort of slapstick series. And we pitched between the two Granada and STV and see who would give us the best deal. Scottish television offered us the most turned out to be, I have to say a bunch of shysters. Oh, really? Um, and I learned how narcissistic, how um, money grabbing, how controlling and how nasty the television industry really is. But we did do two series of this ep of these uh, this comedy thing for kids. And it was broadcast on ITV. Um, and we spoke as these aliens in a gobbledygook language, uh, which was a bit like this. Oh, cosy, you slubber. She's shimp a cat shoe, flubber. No, no shimp in flim, slubber. We did a shim. Oh, a shlim. Oh, you dick. <laughs> there was a lot of absolute nonsense. Um, but we, it was great. But the directors didn't understand it, didn't understand comedy, didn't understand children. And uh, this, or, but we got, um, at the time, there was only four television stations, you know, the sort of terrestrial ones BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, and Channel Four. And we got 33 percent share of the audience from the figures and people were very impressed and I said oh blimey look at that that's very good um but due to some politics which we were nothing to do with we didn't get 
as a number of other shows at the time, um, because of shenanigans that were going on within the TV industry, which was another lesson I learned, um, we didn't get the third series. And, and if you get a th third series in TV, you're sort of, and it's successful, you're on the road. So we kind of got dropped, which was a shame. Then it's not a shame now because yeah. I'm very pleased not to have been in it, really. Yeah. Um, and that was the, the, kind of when the the internet was really beginning to take things. You could make longer format shows or programs or or videos. And so I then thought, uh, okay, I'm going to take my stuff to direct to the public instead of going through television where they control everything, own everything, and um, muck about with your rights. And I started to think, well, what can I do? that isn't going to be as expensive as television. And I realised we live in this beautiful world, and, and I live in England, I'm an Englishman, and I was very proud of being, and still am proud of being an Englishman, even though as we've seen the uglification of Britain, left, right and yeah. centre. Yeah. Um, and I thought, I'm going to show off the, the joys of this country. So I set myself up as the bald explorer and with a little camera, I would go around on walks and explore landscape, heritage and nature. And and then it very much became about trying to promote England as an interesting place and our history, such as we understand our history or what we've been taught about our history, because so much now is like yeah. inverted. And so I was doing that for a long time. Um, and then as we came up towards Brexit, that was when I started to realise that things weren't quite the way they were because I remembered going into the common market as a young man. I didn't really have much interest in politics. I wanted to be a film producer and things. Um, but I, I did remember up until then, as a plucky little country, as a plucky Englishman, as um, British people, let's say, we stood up on our own and we we were, did quite well in the world. Thank you very much. We offered the world lots of different things. Okay, so we, we also gave a whole lot of terrible other things, but, you know, no one's perfect. And when the Brexit argument came, I thought, well, we've been under the EU now for a while. They've been dictating. They're unelected. They're unaccountable. Uh, there's no way to sort of make a, a thing and everyone's moaning about them. Let's get out. So I was quite happy to get out and stand up for ourselves. We did it during the Battle of Britain uh, where we were on the front line with aeroplanes dropping bombs on us. And I thought, well, we can we can stand on our own. And then I realised that the BBC, who I used to listen to, I listened to, used to listen to the Archers um, <laughs> regularly, the, the everyday story of country folk. da 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, and I heard the storylines being very biased in one way and quest uh, any questions on Radio 4 I used to listen to uh, was very biased. And I thought, God, they all really want us to stay in the EU. The BBC was supposed to be impartial and not impartial at all. And it was so bleeding obvious mm. that I, in the end I stopped I stopped watching television. I stopped listening to the radio. In fact, I revoked my TV licence, got rid of all of that. And then, as you say, we got into into towards the COVID pandemic, and 2019 came along towards the end. And we started to see these videos of these Chinese people dropping down, and it was sort of all oh, they've got this terrible disease. Well, having spent most of my life making videos and things, I looked at these and I thought, this is the fakest kind of videos I've ever seen, and people are expecting this to be true. This is rubbish. Um, and so as it started to spread and I could see the news with one story and then there were those people that are talking about the Barrington Declaration and they weren't, you know, they wanted just to have their opinions aired and say that there might be another way. But oh, no, no, the science is fixed, as we'd heard with climate change and all that rubbish. And I thought that this is not right. So I didn't buy into it at all. Hmm. Um, but did you ever I'm, wear a mask? No, no, didn't wear a mask. That was ridiculous, you know, you're trying to poison yourself that way and, and be subservient. Um, and so going into supermarkets was great fun. Yeah. Going in there and they were saying, you know, uh, uh, where's your mask? This is what I don't need one. I, I like to breathe. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I didn't really, I think if you just walked in, I mean, I, I'm down on the south coast in sleepy Sussex, so it's not quite so sleepy these days. But um, I think if you walked in with confidence, they would 
they you know people were quite frightened to challenge you uh, but if you were if you walked in not very confident you came in a bit sheepish going oh, I'm not wearing a mask everybody else is mm. then I think people were challenging you more yeah I, I only once had one person and he was um at the till and I was in a supermarket I don't go to supermarkets now by the way uh not now they've got surveillance on every bloody shelf yeah um so I, I don't do that that don't play that game but during the pandemic I did and this guy shouted out he said to me can you put on your mask <laughs> like that right across everyone and I looked at him and I said you're asking the wrong question mate and he looked a bit miffed <laughs> and I said you you I said I can put my mask on but what you mean is will I and no I won't and then I walked on and um Obviously, I can put it on, but I chose not to. So um, I only had that real one issue. But I was going out because I was making these videos every day about landscape, heritage and nature. When they locked us down, I was still going out. And oh, my God, the viewers, they were going, oh, no, Richard, don't go out. For goodness sake, don't go out. You're going to kill people. You're going to kill granny. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And I said, there's nobody out here. I'm on my own walking about in the countryside or even in the town. There's nobody out here. I remember once going over the South Downs and I saw someone coming towards me. And as he came towards me, he suddenly saw me and he stopped dead and he reversed into a hawthorn bush. It's like he saw me coming down this. And it was like, you know, the vehicles that go, this vehicle is reversing. It was like this, this, this human is reversing. Oh, my God. And as I passed him, buried in this bush, prickly hawthorn bush, I said to him, Good morning. Nice day, isn't it? And just carried on walking. The fear. And I thought, my God, here we are. You've got to get outside, get some vitamin D on you, get some fresh air. The last place you need to be is trapped inside behind screens in artificial light. And I just didn't understand how people were acquiescing. So I, I just ignored it, really, most of the time. Um, I did. I did um, have some challenges. I mean, I did. I'm ashamed to admit this now, but I did wear a mask. But it, the partner I was with at the time, only only a couple of times, he was a rule follower, and um, and it created problem. I'm not with him now, obviously, but um, it created problems, and so um, and so I did end up wearing it a couple of times just to keep the peace. Um, but I did get challenged in B and Q and a couple of other places. But the worst for me was uh, we were in um, I can't remember somewhere. We'd gone away for the weekend and we were in this um, little supermarket place and this woman in front of me literally screamed in my face to get two metres away um, because I was not wearing a mask and how dare I and all the rest of it. I, I was I was gobsmacked at just the fear that I could see coming from her, um, which is a shame that, that it did get people to that level. Um, but some, some, some days I was like, oh, stop being so pathetic and wake up. Can you not see what we can see? But then you have to have more sympathy and empathy for people because the programming has been huge, hasn't it? Mm. All of our lives. So, Oh, absolutely. Yes. The programming has been insanely clever yeah. um, and people were so scared. So I totally agree that, um, you know, you've got to um, give people the benefit of the doubt here because they really thought the world was coming to an end, even though, I had a different perspective to them um, and and there was you could see there was very little point trying to argue the toss because yeah. they you know they've got the BBC and the rest of mainstream media and all the press and all the authority figures saying you're an idiot if you don't do this and and so you know clearly people saw me as as um, a, 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 a secret agent spreading germs left right and center <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so I have, I don't, um, you know, some people are very angry at those people who acquiesce to all the things, but I, to me, it was just bafflement. It was yeah. just baffling to see, and in a way disappointing that people were not able to use any critical thinking and common sense, because there were plenty of people speaking out, but they were so shut down and demonized. And I thought, this is really weird, this group think has taken hold of everybody. Mm. Um, I only hope now that people reflect and go, yeah, actually, I did I did sort of get carried away with it. Um, and I did say silly things to people about 
how they should wear masks and how they shouldn't. So should anything like this ever happen again, and, you know, people say it may well do, that they will actually use a bit more critical thinking. But fear is a is a big hurdle to get over for a lot of people. And um, so, hope, yes, I'd... Sorry, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, I hope you're right, but I'm not convinced. <laughs> oh, you're not You're not convinced. Well, I, I mean, I do have a lot of... Uh, I have a lot of faith in people. And I think, you, you, you know, for me, you, you've got to have faith because without people we're we're you know if people do turn on you and you have that herd mentality then we're all gonna be doomed <laughs> so uh um i i do have a little bit of um positive and i try to stay positive because we're all under the thumb we're all given the doom talk left right and center so i don't watch mainstream media i don't as i say i don't have a television and i've noticed now on youtube there's so much um negative i mean the, you, you know that's how you get your views put a negative thumbnail on and that and you'll get loads of views put a positive nice happy story nobody's interested mm. um and and that's a difficult thing because you want viewers to share your ideas but at the same time you you, you don't really want to put people into fear um because okay. otherwise you're doing the devil's work well yeah exactly um it's so so easy to get um sucked into all of that and um, just this morning there was that fear going on on a chat that I'm involved with on telegram or wherever and um I, I just had to try and calm her down because she was out outraged at something she just discovered you know about our bricks and mortar and the fact that they're all going to be taken from us and all of this sort of stuff and, and it is easy to um get sucked into all of that um but you're absolutely right when you give that energy to it we're just feeding the beast aren't we and um it needs to be love and light, not that it's that easy to keep the love and light going, you know, when, especially when you've got your own challenges, like, you know, I've got my own challenges as well, you know, that I've been fighting the system. And some days you wake up and you're like, shit, what the hell am I doing? Um, and other days I keep saying I'm a spiritual being having a human experience and it's all one big pantomime and it's all going to work out in the end. It's just going to be a bit of a bumpy road as we go. Um, so in terms of, you know, your countryside viewing, your videos that you did, was that all on YouTube or was that on TV? What, where was that played? So it was all on YouTube. Uh, but when I first started, I was doing 40 minute um, productions because I was effectively doing a television type program on YouTube. And so I spent like three months putting together one video um, so I would script, I would read on the subject that I wanted to do. I would then script this thing. I would go on location to look at the places I was going to film, checking off as if an, as if a location manager going, where's the nearest toilet? Where are the aeroplanes flying? Will that affect my soundtrack? Um, where can I park? Uh, where can I get teas and coffees? Um, what time does, the, where's the nearest school? So when kids come out, they're not going to be, you know, yeah. you're filming, is this going to be on the telly, Mr. All this sort of stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it's like, I was treating it as a very, very professional thing because I'd come from that sort of world and I'd witnessed the, the, all the different departments of it. What should I wear? How would I present myself? Um, somebody to operate the camera. I was, I did most of the camera work apart from the bits I appeared in and, and then I would, Oops, I would work them out because I, I, you know, I love both sides of it. Um, and then I, so I put this together and I did some CG. I had to learn CG and to get some nice graphics and all of this sort of stuff. So it would take for bloody ages. And I would put it out and five people would watch it. And I would go, oh, that's a lot of hard work for five people. And there's no money as well. You know, you just didn't. And I did this six times with six different um ideas and six different bits about the countryside and things um and then i started to think this is not really working because i'd start i then was watching how to be successful on youtube videos and i realized oh you've got to pump this stuff out really quickly and deliver it as as swiftly because people just uh, they just digest the content so fast and so rapidly so I realized then what I needed to do was these these walks. I got myself a GoPro and, and before GoPro had stabilization, um, I had to get a little gimbal. So I would hold this gimbal and I would go on these country walks and I realized I had to dumb it down a bit. So it was just me 
on a walk in a in, relatively interesting place. And if there was a church or a big country house or walking through a wood, say, in the autumn, I would point to the trees. I had to learn then, what tree is that? Oh, that's an oak. OK, I was trying to remember that's an oak and that's a willow and that's an ash and that's a hawthorn. You know, so you're trying to so say so that you didn't look like, oh, look, there's another tree and there's another tree. And there's another tree. <laughs> so you start to have something to talk about as you're going around, make it interesting uh, with limited e editing so that I could turn it around. So in the end, I was doing daily walk every day. I would knock out a walk for about 20 minutes and. Um, and that started to build the audience. Then they started to see the backs, the, the 40 minute ones, and it start, and then started to grow an audience. But it never really grew huge until I started talking about what we're talking about these days. Right. Um, but my love was in the filming, you know, and every now and again, I would do a proper one, what I would call a proper one, where you take a proper camera and a tr tripod and you'd get some beautiful shots and... Um, some depth of field and some beautiful lighting. And, and then when I had a drone, get some drone shots and, and, and spend time editing it and put it really nice just to prove I could still do it, um, which was, you know, part of my passion. But it would be inevitable. That would only get, you know, a few hundred views. And the one that I just sort of had a locked off camera and walked about or just spoke to the camera about stuff, that would get more views. And I just thought this, this is really bizarre. It's a very bizarre platform to be on. Um, but that it, it was generating a little bit of income in those days, n not enough to survive because I was actually doing corporate videos as well. That was, the, right. that was one of the jobs I was doing. I, prior to that, um, which I haven't mentioned, in the interim, I um, was um, doing, I went to mime school for a year. Homework there is horrific, lots of lines invisible lines of course you could just write it like this and go yeah that's about right um i'd like to do my school in ai i wonder what that would be like um but uh, yes and you know you do the wall and all the usual sort of stuff that people want like to see and all this kind of caper and then i i learned juggling and unicycling and fire eating i lay on a bed of nails i walked on glass and i would do all this at uh gala shows family shows on the corporate circuit at big dinners um luncheons and things and and then you know lord and lady so and so and bits and pieces like that um in which i would be employed to entertain which was great was great fun but never really what i wanted to do but it earned a living and and it helped me pay the mortgage and bring up the wife and two and three kids yeah so how, how did you, did you, were you well connected? Because I was listening to you on James Dallingford the other day and um, you, you mentioned some of that. And you said you've never really had a proper job, you know. Not really, yeah. Of, in terms of doing the, you know, the... Nine like, to five, uh, yeah. I can't understand why people do nine to five, by the way, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so in terms of like when you were doing the corporate videos and then you did the mime in and then you had corporate gigs and you were actually the the entertainment... How how easy did you find getting that work? Did, were you well connected with people? Or? Well, I was crap at getting. I'm crap, I'm crap at getting work myself. Um, <laughs> but fortunately, there are these theatrical agencies, and so you sign up with a theatrical agent, and they're the ones that get the work, and they ring you up and they say, uh, "Hi, Richard, are you uh, are you free on the third of September?" Uh, and I said, "Well, I'm I'm not. I'm never free, but I might be available." Yeah. Um, and so people would, um, you know, you'd, you'd fill your diary up, they'd wait for the phone. It did take time to get established, of course. You know, you'd sign up with these agents and then they'd they'd all be going, oh, yes, darling, we'll get you loads of work, darling. There's no problem at all. <laughs> and then the phone wouldn't ring for months. And you're thinking, oh, cry, I'm going to have to either go to the job centre or um, I'll have to get a job and, and do what everybody else did. But there was something in me that was very independent. That's, you know, and I got from my, my dad ran his own business my mum did work at a supermarket, but she was quite independent. She would go around um, smashing the tins. You know, she would drop tins deliberately and then put them on the <laughs> on the shelf where they were, you know, discounted. And she'd go, oh, these, these are discounted. I think I'll have these. And so she was independently minded. Um, so I was very lucky, I think, growing up with um, parents that um, made me think outside the box. I left school at 15. So I, I hadn't been terribly ingrained 
to the do as you're told, do as you must, you know. And I, I mean, I did go to a comprehensive boys' school um, and I hated it. I just didn't fit in. I, I was the one that used to get bullied, you know. They used me as a... Um, as a battering ram against the school. And I can tell you the school is still standing and and my hair has since fallen out. So, um, you know, uh, so yes, I, I, and I often say, you know, I I couldn't bear to have a proper job. Uh, Many times I've had to consider that. And of course it's not a slur on anybody who does. And, And of course I'm not, I'm not saying that the people who have proper jobs are far richer, have have nicer houses, have bigger cars, um, have pensions and all those sort of things that I don't have. I don't have all those things, but I am and, and I don't I don't aim for those. I'm not a materialistic person, so um, I'm quite happy. I'd be happy in a caravan or a shepherd's hut in the middle of nowhere growing a few vegetables and getting on you know i don't need very much to 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 get on in life just to survive because i enjoy sitting down doing nothing not (laughs) well you know just to sort of be on myself but i i don't get time to do that not running the youtube channel and the interviews and the monologues and doing talks and everything else I, i seem to landed myself an incredibly busy life but actually really in the evenings my partner and I we sit down we light the fire we have a a wood-burning stove which we cook on we light that and we read to each other we don't have television we look at the fire and we read to one another we cook together um, with um, raw ingredients so we we don't go to the supermarket and buy tv dinners or all all or supermarket meat uh, or nutrient free food um deplete of vitamins and stuff we go to farm shops and we only have one meal a day so you know we're not constantly cramming ourselves full of all the crap that people do um and it sounds holier than now it's just a very simple life and and it suits me down to the ground it suits my partner down to the ground it's not to say you know when we're on the road we have to eat the rubbish that you find in the supermarkets but i haven't been into a big supermarket for over a year now and um i'm told that morrison's have cameras on every shelf and that there's face recognition and i just think why would you go in there and why would you sell your soul to the devil by going in there and when i'm doing talks um and one of the questions i ask the audience is how many people these are all truthers and freedom people yeah. and you know lawful people and I, and and i say to them how many of you go to supermarkets and at least half put their hands up and i just think what are you doing? Yeah. Now, admittedly, not everybody is near a supermarket. It's um, it's about a fourteen mile journey for me to go to the farm shop that we do, seven miles there and seven miles back, and you know it's a morning's task. We only go once a week, and I have a veg box as well. Um, so it's doable, but it is a pain in the neck. But I don't work nine to five. I work at home mostly, and do these interviews and things so it it works so i appreciate not everybody can do it i do i do get that but most of the people who come to the talks for my age and or above they're all retired and i do wonder what they do with, with yeah. their days yeah i know it is crazy i mean we we go to the farm mostly there's there's still a couple of things we need to get from the supermarket like you know i haven't i haven't got the time to go fully making my own um, cleaning products and and hand soap. Ah, but there are corner shops. Corner shops do that. Mm, yes, mm. I know they're more expensive. Yeah, and yeah, I go, I, I go to the corner. Shops. You see, the yeah. thing is, I think here we are. Um, here we are with supermarkets, big corporations taking over everything. Yeah. We're in this corporate takeover, and we we feel oh, but supermarkets is the only thing. And yet there is a network up and down of family-run corner shops yeah, yeah. run by uh, wonderful independent people, Pakistanis and Indians and uh, some, some, what would you say, Europeans, Polish, what have you. Um, and they're all wonderful, hardworking people. And they still, okay, they store the big brands. I get that. So they'll have the bleach with the with the brand name on it and what have you. And it may be a little bit more expensive, but I would rather go there and support them so the money goes in their pocket and they can keep their business going than the big corporations who are ripping us off and giving us limited choice and pretending that they're all friendly 
Um, and, and so I think it's perfectly doable. And this network, if they were, if we could convince them to get organic, proper organic farm yeah. food in their shops, yeah. which I think is something that, it, again, is doable, we'll find that as people realise that the, that food is the most important thing that we can go and invest in, because it, it, it will fight the chemtrail crap and the fluoridation of the water and the EMFs and everything else, then we actually have a family-friendly, uh, private organization of shop network of shops that we can support and they can support us and we can do away with these corporations but it it just takes an effort yeah yeah no you're dead right um yeah I, it's me and my son um that uh, that are here currently and it's him that you know he gets bits and bobs but he's very like puerile with his food and everything and so it's all organic and all of that and uh he's educated me a lot um, because it is more expensive, you know, um, to, to go that way. But it is so worth it. And why wouldn't you spend the extra to put decent stuff into your body? I mean, yeah, I, I totally get it. And um, I'm going to I'm going to heed that those words in terms of. All right, Jake, my son, um, let's stop doing the OK a bit and let's just go to the corner shop and uh, we'll see what he says. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, this is just my idea. It's I, I, you know, these are my opinions, and I don't say anybody. Yeah, yeah, nobody yeah. has to do what I say. Yeah. Uh, it's just an opinion, and, and often I get criticised, of course, and say, "Oh, Richard, we, we, you know, it's all right for you." And yeah, maybe it is. That's my life, isn't it? But uh, and I'm not saying people must do this. I'm just saying there is this network of of corner shops. They are there, and the more that we invest in them and persuade and help them to yeah. develop their shops. They're independent of the supermarkets. Okay, they buy from cash and carry and some of their stuff might yeah. be a bit dubious and all of that. But they're more likely to be persuadable than the buying um, manager of massive great big supermarkets who are have bought into the WEF and all the other crap. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Just going back, um, I was mm. like, oh, that sounds lovely. When you were talking about you and your partner reading to each other, when did that start? Oh, about, I suppose, about three years ago now. Um, we, I mean, I've been a great reader and I al I've always loved reading out loud. And I suppose my theatrical background mm. used to do amateur dramatics and as a performer, you know, sort of um, a bit um, outgoing in that fashion. So I've always enjoyed reading out loud and I've enjoyed writing. And so I'd read my stuff out loud. Um, and often when julia and i got together i one of the first things i said to her you know in our sort of lovey-dovey stuff i said i'd love to read to you and so she said well go on then and so i would read and then as i read she said oh, i'd like to read to you so we would get i mean we read a lot of old books old fashion books a lot of old farming books funny enough farming stories and and landscape stuff and things that nature and things that we're interested in and so you know when i read i do sort of try and make the characters come to life and put silly voices on and all those sort of things. Um, and it's only to each other. It's not like on a stage or anything like that. And we just have a, we, we just have a bit of fun mm -hmm. and, and I'll read if she's, if, she, if she's cooking and if I'm cooking and we both share all of this and share the washing up and all of those sort of nonsense. Um, we just, we spend most of the evenings in the kitchen round the fire. Um, and if we've got guests, then they'll they'll end up having the same treatment uh, <laughs> and lots of talking. Well, I came to the conclusion, having had this television history, that and and my absolute love of wanting to be on the telly. Um, and I used to do extra work and walk on parts. You know, I was um, in the bill for many many years as white shirt behind frosted glass at the end of the corridor. <laughs> that that was me. It's big starring role. You probably saw, <laughs> saw that blur, and that was me. <laughs> um, uh, or uh, you know, an arm would come in with a bit of paper here, our Sarge type touch, you know, right? That sort of uh, starring role. Uh, but after I realised that actually we spend our lives in front of this screen, we go to work, we slave away, we give all our money in taxes, and we're persuaded by the adverts to separate ourselves from from the from our earnings on all this trinkets which are supposed to make us happy only to find that the next trinket is an upgrade and that will make you happy uh, but then the next trinket and so on and so on and i realized once you turn all that off what are you going to do actually you've got all this time to be yourself 
yeah. and do your own thing. So yeah, we we just enjoy reading and that's that's our thing. And talking and having conversation. Yes. Um and not letting somebody else do the thinking for us. Yeah. And telling us what we should buy and what clothes we should wear and what type of kitchen we should have and how our bathroom should look and what bits of chemicals that we should have on our body that they don't tell us is causing us all sorts of skin issues or, you know, or other problems. And so it's amazing when you switch off all of that mainstream media and everybody else telling you what to do and you start to decide for yourself what you want to do. Julia plays um, the ukulele, so she sometimes um, plays songs and I'll listen and wash up and clatter along with the spoons, that sort of thing. And it's, it's you know, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. And it's it's nobody else's business. It's our private world. What you can't do is uh, discuss, just just uh, stand at the water cooler as, as they call it these days and say oh yeah last night we uh reread such and such because nobody else has ever read the same books that we read um but th that's all right we don't go to the water cooler because we have completely separate lives so um it is a, i mean i know it's an unusual world and people would just laugh and go oh my god you know but uh, when i meet people and they say oh, i was watching such and such the other night and it's like i don't know what you're talking about he said, you haven't been following the series all night. And I said, no. Have you been reading any AG Street recently? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about either. It's like, I don't yeah. care. No. Well, that's great. So it's, it's back to traditional values, really. And it's all about, like you said, being present and, um, and being with each other. Um, yeah. And I think that's so important today with bringing the kids up to be able to bring them to the table, get rid of the phones, get rid of the screens, yeah. just, for, just for that one moment where you're sitting and, and sharing, breaking bread, you know, the old thing. How was your day? Are they teaching you to masturbate at school? Oh, are they? How interesting. <laughs> That's very nice. Have you done the homework? Let's see the tissues. Um, you know, th th I mean, this is going on. But if you're able to get the family around the table and talk about it, you can sort of, is that really what's going on at school? Oh, yeah, you've signed... Apparently, kids are now being told to sign a document, children under 16, signing a piece of paper to say they cannot, they must not tell their parents what's going on in school. I mean, this is just obscene. Um, but this is what, and they put the thumbprint to it. This is, you know, and this is what I'm being told at some of these events that I go to. Really? Um, and it's just it's so frightening what kids and you, we need to get them back round the table and, and get them off the screens and watching the propaganda and yeah. being programmed and, and all of that. Um, yeah. So that the next generation have got a chance to fight back against this uh, tyrannical system. Yeah, totally agree. Um, so in terms of your journey then, um, so you were doing the countryside stuff. It wasn't really generating what you wanted it to generate. And then you got into this. Did you get into this 2020? Was that when it all sort of started for you? Well, I did start to talk. I mean, one of the, back in, I suppose, 19, let me think, two, no, 2006, I ran a, an audio podcast, just a you know an MP3 back in the day when podcasts were brand spanking new and nobody ever heard of them. Yeah. Only the geeks who made them knew what they were. Um, somebody was telling me about this thing called man-made global warming, and I remembered getting this thing from somebody, and I was and I just read this and I said, "Man-made global warming, no such thing. That is a load of tosh." And 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 of course, everyone was saying, "No, no, Richard, it is a thing. It is a thing." And I, and I remember then seeing, um, oh, what's his name? Oh, it's gone out of my head now. What's his name? Going through the bushes um, from our childhood. The uh, Bellamy, uh, David Bellamy. Hey, David Bellamy, dear old David Bellamy. Going through the bushes there, as you can see all those lovely plants, and I can see O two absolutely essential for him. Uh, and of course, then he was very taken good, out. very good. Um, and I just thought, well, I, I respect him. And then David Attenborough was doing quite the reverse with his blue planet and all this, oh, we're all going to die business and we're poisoning the planet, aren't we nasty people? And I thought, that's a shame, D David. I respected your brother, Richard Attenborough, who was, was a good actor. But, um, and I met Richard Attenborough once, he's right old lovey. Um, but I thought, no, this is, uh, this is really strange. So I got, that the climate change thing was a complete con. Um, and then COVID was a con. Brexit was a con. 
Um, and and I realized that these big, all these big things were cons, but I hadn't really sort of started to talk about it. Little tiny times I would talk about it, but the audience was sort of like, oh, no, don't talk about that. And during COVID, of course, they hated it if I mentioned things. But my son worked in A&E during the COVID lockdowns. Right. And uh, he was in the reception at A&E and he was living here. In fact, the, the, this very room, I live in a two up, two down Victorian house. It's a shabby little house. Um, and this is the master bedroom. He no longer lives here, um, but he did during the lockdown. And I said to him, what's it like in the hospitals? Because we're told they're rammed with people dying and um, turning blue and, you know, on ventilators and all of this. And he said, and he was very cagey about what he said, but he basically said it's not full. He said, yes, there are people coming in with broken legs and um, cancers and other, you know, the normal sort of run of the mill diseases that people get. But when it came to the uh, the, the so-called virus thing, he said, we're, we're not really seeing that many. He said, but there is a protocol at the door. So somebody would come in with a broken leg and or um They'd had an accident, a bone sticking out, you know, through their bum or something. And they were walking funny, blood gushing everywhere. They'd said, oh, no, come in and sit down, wait for eight hours and you'll get triaged. Um, please don't call out. There's an uncomfortable seat over there you can sit on and um, no one will attend to you. And, so, you know, normal practice. Yeah. Um, and then but if somebody came in with, say, sniffles or sore throat or couldn't taste their food or were worried or they said the words, I think I've got, you know what? Um, it was as if an alarm went off in the hospital. It was like, I mean, it didn't actually happen, but it was as if, you know, the warning, boop, 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 big arrow came down on that individual. They were given a mask immediately, told to stand out in the car park about 10 or 20 feet from my son who had a clipboard, took their name. What's your name? What's your date of birth? Always good to get the date of birth because, as it says on it, it doesn't identify you. So uh, make sure you get that. And then they were taking the symptoms, a name and address, and then they, you know, can you breathe? Y yeah. Okay, you can go home. But I think I've got this terrible pandemic disease that's going around. No, yeah, no, you go home. And when you're blue in the face and you can't actually breathe and you're minutes from death, come back. And then we'll put you on a ventilator and we'll stop you breathing. And if that doesn't work, we've got a friend here called Mad Mad Madazlan Matt who will help you on the Liverpool pathway and uh, finish your days nice and quickly. I mean, I'm I'm joking it up a bit, but he was they were told not to. It, nobody with um, the big that C, that version of the big C, were allowed in and they were sent home, which I remember thinking um, this was a nonsense, because if you you know, you're in the shower and you're washing and you put your hand in certain place and you get, oh, there's a lump there. I didn't expect to be a lump. And you go to the GP ordinarily and the GP would not want to put his hand on your lump. Thanks very much. And then say, so I tell you what, we'll get a referral. You'd go to the hospital. They'd scan you. They'd look at it and go, oh, yeah, early intervention. That was the thing. But with the with the pandemic business, it was no late intervention was the policy. Yeah. So I was mentioning this in my shows and the audience were going, no, we don't want to hear this. Shut up, Richard. You've got to do as they say and get on with it. So I found it very difficult to talk about it because the audience were just not interested. And it wasn't until 2022, this about this time, so two years ago, um, I watched GB News when GB News was just about watchable. Um, and good old Neil Oliver was on there. We had a fuel crisis, all the fuel had was over the top people were a bit like now when all the prices are going up and everything and he said i wonder what would happen if nobody paid their bills and i thought that's a good idea i wonder what would happen so i made a video just instead of doing a walking video i just sat on my little chair and i just said to the camera and i just did it as a didn't expect it to go anywhere and i just said is he right what would happen if we didn't pay our bills? Do you think that the government would take the blind bit of notice? And I put a thumbnail of Neil Oliver on, is he right? Uploaded it, thought maybe a couple of hundred people, a thousand people might, you know, see it. Within two days, 100,000 people had seen that video. Wow. And I thought, oh, my God, people <laughs> do want to talk about this. So I made a couple more like that, thinking, I wonder how long I could get away with this. 
and two years later, I'm still doing it. Um, and they, they, the audience, though, was sending me down the rabbit holes. They said, have you seen this? Have you seen this? And I realized my old audience, who were utterly disgusted with what I was doing, left. And a whole new audience of an amazing, bright, uh, intelligent, open-minded, critical thinkers came from apparently nowhere in huge numbers and were pointing, and I was going down the, these rabbit holes going, oh, my God, we're all dead, aren't we? This is the end. This is it. We're doomed. Um, and then I realised, and I was angry, and, you know, you go through the gamut of emotions, don't you? And you go, no, actually, I'm not going to let this happen. And so I carried on talking. But I I did it, as people have called me, the um, Alan Titchmarsh of the conspiracy theorist movement. I did it. In you know, with a I, I haven't got my waistcoat on today, but I did it in a waistcoat, had my cravat and a jacket, and I just did it as me sitting there going, Isn't it strange how the government, the nice, kind, benevolent government, are trying to bump us off in one way or another? Or their policies seem to be incredibly anti human. And I, I started off very gentle, and these became videos that people could actually share with people who were not yet awake to it. And so they were sharing them and, and with, I was just got so much encouragement to keep going. And the audience figures was going up and the um, the uh, subscriber figures. And this was around the time that um, Andrew Bridgen was um, bringing up the, at that point 500,000 yellow cards of harms done to people thanks to the medical intervention in government. And you saw the empty chamber, the, the like of which we'd never seen before. Yeah. And... I thought I'd love to interview him, but he's an MP. He wouldn't talk to a nobody YouTuber. But I sent an email and he rang me back. And he said, I've got, I, I don't, the BBC won't talk to me. Mainstream media won't talk to me. The newspapers won't talk to me. There's no outlet for me. And I thought, oh, I'm the sucker that's going to be the one. <laughs> but he spoke to me and he was brilliant. And that's what started the interviews. And suddenly people were wanting to come on the show and said, I've got something to tell and I've got something to share. And Richard, did you know about money creation? Did you know about spirituality? Did you know about health? And did you know about this protocol, that protocol? And before I knew it, the channel had become this thing where I was doing a monologue in the morning and an interview in the afternoon. And it's progressed like that. And then people said, Richard, can you come and talk? And it's yeah. like, well, golly, what do I talk about? And so I had this rapid um, rise, if you like, but I'm still the nobody YouTuber. Um, I'm still me, who is still this sort of slightly outrageous um, uh, private person who enjoys talking to people and spouting views. And, um, and, and I'm still here doing what I do. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I've seen many of your... Um podcasts um i haven't seen the andrew bridgen one though i'd be interested to watch that obviously that was, oh, that was one that was taken off of course oh right that uh, in in about so i did that i put it out in january last year and by april it, it took three or four months for youtube to catch up and then they deceived it as medical misinformation and and it was pulled but it is on rumble and odyssey yeah okay uh i'll check it out over there um well i mean thank god you're doing what you're doing because it's you know it's your the people that you're getting on and the information that you're sharing and your candidness with it all you know like you said you've attracted this completely different audience of people that are awake and critical thinking and all of that sort of stuff um and because people have been you know the, the people that really stood up in the earlier days the doctors the researchers you know um that, and some of them are not with us now. Um, it it took it took some serious balls to do that, um, you know. And you're in that category, okay? Not not like you know a doctor that's going against the whole establishment or whatever. But in doing what you're doing, and uh, like you said, you're hanging on to YouTube. Um, hopefully, you'll be around a lot longer, um, and they won't do anything. But I, I I genuinely believe, and I watched a video this morning actually that was shared with me about apparently you know what's coming over the next few weeks which is all for the good um and so maybe we are we only need to hang on by our fingernails a little bit longer um and things will change who knows but um yeah i just wanted to say 
thank you really to you for, for for doing what you're doing and and bless you you know you've put a couple of my videos on your community which has helped my podcast and I really appreciate that as well thank you well I, I mean people do say you know these very nice things and 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 it's 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 very humbling I have to say it's incredibly humbling because I I don't do it for that reason obviously and um I just sit in front of my camera and I have my views and people want to come and talk to me and I've got a very open mind. I never used to have an open mind, but I have an open mind and I always think the platform is for them. You yeah. know, I've I've been incredibly lucky and if I can help and share and and all of that I will. I get now it's it's very difficult to do all of that because I'm so bombarded by emails and requests and things and and you think, God, I don't know how some of the even really big ones manage it because it, you you start to see how difficult it, it can be. Um, but I'm more than happy. I mean, sometimes, you know, people who've got, I remember, I think well, a few months ago now, somebody said, look, I, you're the first interviewee I'm doing on the show. I've got about 20 subscribers. And, and I said, it's fine. You know, I'm not some big whatever uh, I, it, if I can help, I'll help. If I can't, you know, because of other commitments and what have you, it's not it's not a problem. But the the thing that I find most confusing and worrying is when I turn up at groups and, and at talks and things, and then people say, "Oh, Richard, you are brave," and I don't think I'm brave in any way at all. I sit on my chair or in the studio here, and I say my views. I think they're laudable views people don't have to agree with me many people disagree with me some people are making videos that positively disagree with me i don't mind i don't mind you know that's their prerogative to do that and i don't have a pro i don't have a problem with that everybody should have the right to free speech the problem i have is if any of us are being squashed or intimidated or cajoled or mandated or forced against our will in any shape or form by a government who is supposed to be working for us and all the corporations um, that affect us. That annoys me. And, and I feel that we should be able to stand up and we shouldn't feel brave doing that. That should be our absolute right to do that. Um, so, but it is humbling when people say things like you said, um, because I don't really feel I've earned any of it. I'm just doing what I, I would imagine anybody else would do or should do or could do but haven't um but, but maybe so, they haven't so. exactly so so yeah take take the praise it's well deserved you know you've you've put all of your skills and natural strengths into this you know this is the journey that you've been on up to this point has got you to where you are right now and you have been, been able to be that voice for people that are too scared to stand up and be counted you know which is still a lot of people and and a lot of people in the truth the movement as well you know but everybody, I mean, I, the only reason I push back is it's it's very easy for people like me to sort of take the praise and say, oh, yes, I'm, you know, aren't I amazing? But actually, I'm not doing the work. I mean, I I'm, I'm represent the work to other people by getting them on. The real people are the ones that we don't see who are fighting the battles, who yeah. are on their own. Um, and they you know, they don't know necessarily all the information. They're the ones who've got the bailiffs banging on the door, being thrown out, evicted from their houses, or having their children taken away. They're, you know, they're the ones who who are, are really struggling. Or the doctors and the professionals that you said, whose careers have yeah. just been dead. They're the ones that really need the support. And and that's where I feel if 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 by being where I am on YouTube, I can help. Then it's a duty. It's a duty to help your fellow man. Mm. And I feel that most strongly. So that's why I often push back against, you know, people don't need to praise me. Um, the ones, you know, it's 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 the people who are really doing the work. Um, yeah. But if I can throw a little bit of humour yeah. and lighten people's lives up just a bit by perhaps laughing at the situation a little bit and, and so that people feel a little less under uh, less overwhelmed then you, you know that's my background as you say the entertainment that's sort of taking the mickey and having a joke about it mm. um but um it is it's it all very sincerely meant of course yeah yeah okay and um well, what's next for you if there is a next for you is it a case of 
I mean, it seems to me like you're a very you're a very creative, entrepreneurial kind of individual. You've done lots of things, you and created things, created a TV show for kids, you know, and all of that sort of stuff. So, have you got new ideas brewing all the time in terms of what you want to do next? Because at some point, this kind of show, I guess, when it does all come out in the open, um, will change again, right? Because we're not going to be these tin foil hat wearers. We're actually going to be oh, right, so you guys were talking the truth all the time. Um, so have you thought beyond the next year, two years, as, as to what that might look for you, look like for you? Uh, for, for my partner and I, we, we still hanker this simple life. Yeah. Um, and we want, like so many people, we want a bit of land. We would like to have um, a little farm or a, a small holding. Excuse me. We would like to have um, Guernsey cows, um, some ducks, some chickens, some bees, some pigs. Um, and actually, I, I'm a filmmaker as well. So I'm always going to be sort of charting what I do and sharing stuff. So I see the channel moving beyond the reporting and sharing ideas. I feel that that's close to the end of that. And the next phase is is about actually doing the solutions, showing people that you can have a simple, simpler life, that you can um, take back responsibility for yourself and your own food, that we you don't need other people. You don't need the professionals to provide your entertainment. You can do it yourself. And that actually the magic is within us, um, that we have inside us all the tools and the knowledge that we need to have an amazing life and the, the the life that's we've been misled into thinking the nine to five, the working for big corporations, just to continue to get people consuming is um, a nonsense. And that actually there is, you know, this world, if you take away all the man-made crap, but not all of it, because a lot of man-made stuff is very beautiful because we are artists and creative and all that. It's a very beautiful world. Mm. And and the human body is an incredible, beautiful um, biological machine, if I can use the word machine. Um, there's so much wonderful things that we do not see on a daily basis. So that if you're working with animals, you're growing plants, or you're close to nature, or you're connected to the earth, that is so life enhancing. Um, and yet we we wear the rubber soled shoes, we on tarmac behind glass and steel. We're surrounded by LED lights now, and they're ever more trying to get us into a digital virtual world. The old analog world still has and retains much that is important and critical to us as living souls in this iteration that we are now. And and that's where I think my message and my want to show in, in the future. Yeah, yeah, um, that sounds perfect. I was going to ask you, actually, because I know you had Dave Silver on again recently and he's promoting the One Planet development. Is that something that you're interested in? Um, I'm uh, My staunch independentness is sometimes something that battles against me. So... I think that the concept is brilliant and I think it will be great for a lot of people, but I think for myself, it's like, I want to do it my own way. <laughs> I just, and that might work against me. Mm. Uh, but I think that um, self-sufficiency is an absolute key, but John Seymour wrote a series of books in the late sixties and seventies about self-sufficiency. Um, and they're great books. And he, he used to live on a boat he sold the boat, went to work, uh, sorry, bought a house in Norfolk in the middle of nowhere, created his own farm with his family, tried to go self-sufficient. He said it was the hardest thing you had. To, you know, you worked your fingers to the bone. And at the end of it is very little return, even though you, you wanted that life. But the secret really of self-sufficiency, sufficiency, it seems to me, is that you're surrounded by a community of people who are doing similar things, but you only concentrate on one or two things. So you might have cows and raw milk and perhaps some eggs. Somebody else 
yeah. is doing growing of vegetables and you're trading amongst yeah. all these different people doing different things. And then if you've got people who are good with leather, who can make leather goods and belts and saddles and uh, a cobbler and and somebody who's a, um, a herbalist and and you're you're able to share all those things, almost going back to sort of Saxon times with the old Saxon yeah. way things were done. Um, your trading is with other family run, family orientated communities who get together. You can have drinks in the old tavern um, and and have an enjoyable life without the use of big corporations providing you your entertainment and your food and sustenance. You, you, you're doing it yourself in amongst people of your own ilk. Yeah. A bit like the the Amish do in many ways, but not necessarily with a religious bent. Mm, yeah, totally. Okay, cool. Well, um, we've gone past the hour, so I'm going to draw this to um, a close. It's been wonderful to actually meet you, albeit virtually, but um, and have you on and listen to more of your story and your background. I always like to sort of finish with anything that you feel called to share with the audience you know when people have, have sat and watched and listened and got to know you a little bit more what are your parting words anything at all i think that i think really it's it's understanding your authentic self understanding who you are knowing who you are within and without mm. and and once you understand who you really are then start to express that and everything will fall into place yeah yeah, I think you're absolutely uh, spot on with that. I, I had a, a 12 month reading um, last year and every every um, month I print it off and stick it up there. So I, I look at it and read it. And um, October's is all about authenticity for, for sure. So, yeah, I'm totally, totally concur with that one. If um, <clears throat> excuse me, if anybody wanted to reach out to you for whatever reason, where's the best place for them to go? Well, the channel is Richard Vobes on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and um, I have a website, richardvobes.com. And um, somewhere along all, the, all those places is my email address. I have to say that I am swamped with emails, um, which is very difficult. But I do try to read them all. I do struggle sometimes because I get so many um, spam emails amongst it. So it sort of fills up with all sorts of stuff. Um, I don't do any of the other social media uh, nonsense. I try to keep out as much of the screens as possible because I spend so much time in front just answering emails and all of that. Um, but, uh, yeah, otherwise, um, it's always great to meet people at talks and events where I may well pop up. Yeah, I don't always know when they are. Um, yeah. They Again, they, people just ask and they say, will you get, give me a talk or something? And I do my best. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, no, it's a pleasure. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Once again, I've forgotten to, uh, a good friend of mine keeps saying, you don't, you don't do share, like, and subscribe on your bloody channel. You need to do that. So anybody watching, listening, um, do share, do like, do uh, subscribe to the channel. Um, and obviously Richard's as well, which I'm sure you already are. Um, but um, you've got a lot of followers now. But thank you. Thank you very much for today. I know you're very busy. I really appreciate you giving me this time. And um, it's been very insightful to understand more about you, really, as opposed to, you know, the show. So, uh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So thank you again. Oh, it's an ple absolute pleasure. And, and best of luck and good luck with um, all that you do. And uh, I hope that you get millions of views. <laughs> so do I. Thanks, Richard. Take care.